So well, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Marina Maliti, psychiatrist. I do mostly adult ADHD assessments, but I know a lot about childhood since I have to screen for developmental history in my adult patients. So without any further delay, I'm going to proceed with our presentation. And here I have to uh, give you some disclosure. Uh, my financial uh, relationships as well as any conflict of interest. I currently do not have any grants or any research support. I have been paid by Takeda and Synovian, which are pharmaceutical companies for uh, speaking engagements and consultation. I, I have been paid consulting fees via Triumph, which is a small educational company that I work with with an occupational therapist business partner of mine. I don't have any patents, unfortunately. And I also have gotten paid through Ontario Medical Association for my administrative work with them. And I also do insurance assessments through various companies, as well as I do uh, professional coaching, not ADHD coaching, leadership coaching. So that's kind of my financial disclosure. In terms of, again, further financial support, this program received financial support from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in the form of an annual funding agreement. The program has received some in-kind support from KMH and Unity Health Toronto in the form of clinician time, logistical support. And in terms of my potential conflict of interest, I have not received any payment or funding from an organization supporting this program and or organization whose products are being discussed in the program. So that I don't, I don't have any of that financial payment. Yeah, conflict of interest. Okay, so in terms of mitigating potential bias, you know, the information presented here in the CME is based on recent information that is explicitly evidence-based. I do my best to keep updated on the information, and I was double-checking the DSM this morning as Olivia was bugging me to send the slides, so I tried to be as uh, fresh on the information as I can. The CME program and its material is peer-reviewed and all the recommendations involving clinical medicine are based on evidence that is accepted within the profession. And all the scientific research referred to reported are used in the CME CPD activity and support and justification of patient care recommendations conforms to the generally accepted standards of care. Okay. Um, this is another disclaimer I think important for everybody. We're not providing any specific treatment, medical, personal, or legal advice for individual patients or situations. This is educational and general information purposes only. It's very introductory level given the time constraints. And if you are experiencing any mental health distress because of this presentation, please see your own healthcare provider or emergency department. Sometimes when we do presentations, it could be very triggering for personal reasons. And this is why it's important to make sure that we address that. If you're getting triggered, that you seek your own help. Okay, so learning objectives for today. Um, again, we're going to focus on what is ADHD? How do we diagnose ADHD? And special consideration, okay? I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, uh, you will be able to understand more about ADHD and diagnostic consideration and particular and special groups that we need to consider. What is ADHD? You know, I know there's lots of, you know, TikTok and other information, but what is ADHD from a clinical perspective? ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition that affects the executive function in our brain, okay? Neurodevelopmental means that it's something that usually starts in childhood, likely something we're born with. In the past, it used to be classified in a very different category and disruptive behavior category in the previous edition of DSM. But luckily, it's moved over to the neurodevelopmental condition, you know, moving away from what we thought ADHD was a disruptive behavioral issues to more understanding that's more wholesome of a neurodevelopmental condition. Um, DSM-5 is what we use to diagnose the condition. That's the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, fifth edition. TR means it's been revised recently in 2022, and it sets out the diagnostic criteria that clinicians use to diagnose ADHD. And with the DSM-5-TR, again, that's the most recent edition um, since 2022, it focuses with for ADHD to note that it's a condition that affects with persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity. So for the inattention criteria, they have six or more symptoms for at least six months or longer, okay? 
and it's not congruent to the developmental level, you know, where we would expect one to function at that point. Um, and there's also impact in different domains of this person's life. So social, academic, occupational, okay? And when I mean social, I mean, you know, relationships, I mean, just general social functioning that might include parenting, your romantic relationship, friendships, work relationships, right? The hyperactivity domain, also again, six plus symptoms for six months that is incongruent to a mental level and again has several domains of function. When we look at ADHD, we have to be aware that the issues that the patient's having is not due to another medical condition because there could be other things that cause the same presentation. So that's part of the tricky diagnostic clarification. In the DSM, it also says that some of the symptoms have to be there before 12. So if I'm seeing an adult, you know, usually when you go back and you take the mental history, there might be symptoms reported that were there. They may not have been noted or picked up, but they're usually there. Emphasis on several. It doesn't say that you have to have all the symptoms before age 12 or this many, several, which sometimes becomes confusing to in an experienced clinician or psychiatrist for that matter, because they think that, you know, you had to have everything before 12. And it doesn't say one, it doesn't say five, it says several. And that's where we have to use kind of our clinician judgment and gives us a bit of freedom to explore, but also guidance. So again, several symptoms prior age 12, meaning that you know it doesn't usually happen spontaneously at age 30 or 40 or 50. If it's a spontaneous change, probably there's other reasons for this. And if you go back and you take a good history, most patients will recall symptoms before age 12 in childhood. Um, symptoms when we diagnose ADHD have to be in two or more domains of function. So it's not just, you know, I can't pay attention in school or I can't pay attention at home. There, there has to be two or more different areas of function that are affected. At this point, we have three types. We have the combined where people have both um, inattentive and hyperactive symptoms, predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive. Now, if people don't meet all the criteria, but they did in the past, you know, they classified as partial remission. Doesn't mean it's gone. Doesn't mean it's stopped. That is, you know, the way we used to think that people used to grow out by age 18. Fortunately, they don't. So again, sometimes we encounter people who don't have all the criteria today, but they did in the past. They still have ADHD, just in partial remission. Okay. So worldwide prevalence in children is reported as 7.2% by the DSM-5TR uh, in adults 2.5. You can usually symptom see symptoms starting around age four onwards. However, most of the time for most people, you know, the, the diagnosis could be, you know, usually in elementary school, the teachers notice and, and, and onwards, but people can uh, see symptoms early on. Heritability of ADHD is huge. You know, in DSM, it's reported as 74%. In other literature that I read, it's 80%. So it runs in families. It's a family affair. It runs from one generation to another. Hugely, hugely heritable condition. And this is why you might encounter families where you have a parent and the child with ADHD or multiple children with ADHD in the same family, multiple relatives, right? And sometimes families mistake it as a family trait when it's actually ADHD. At this point, we don't have a specific cause for what causes ADHD. There's some risk factors like low birth weight, prematurity, you know, prenatal exposure to smoking, neurotoxins, you know, alcohol, um, drugs and whatnot, infections, but none of these are a causation. So just because a mother's smoking during pregnancy does not mean it causes ADHD. We can't be blaming people for their kids' ADHD. It's, it's not a causation. And also, there's not a single one biological marker. You know, there's no blood test. There's no imaging that we could do and say 100% this is ADHD. So sometimes it makes it difficult for diagnosis or sometimes when, you know, people are struggling to accept the diagnosis, but we don't have a single thing to prove that one has ADHD. And this sometimes leads to a lot of confusion between different clinicians, even different psychiatrists where, you know, they might not agree on a diagnosis because it depends on their experience and their understanding of ADHD. So there's no specific test right now that we can do and say, yep, yeah, this is ADHD. 
The other important thing is when we talk about ADHD is that ADHD could look very different across the same family members, across the genders, and across the lifetime. You might have a family with children who some have hyperactive and some have combined and some have inattentive. And so sometimes you have siblings. One is very much identified by school because they're mostly hyperactive and causing a lot of difficulties at school and a lot of behavioral issues. And then you have my siblings who have mostly predominantly inattentive who are missed or not diagnosed until later in life and because they present differently and sometimes the parents might not even accept that the child has ADHD because they're like you're not like your brother you're not like your sister because they just compare without realizing but ADHD could be very different how ADHD looks in somebody as a child could look very different when somebody's older when they're 40 when they're 50 so so we have to understand that this is a condition that is kind of evolving depending where you're in life um, and many, many factors influence ADHD presentation in front of you. So you can't put two patients and be like, you know, they're, why are they different? You know, it depends on their innate abilities, depends on their environment, depends on the skills, therapy, what they have been taught, depends on other comorbidities, depends on what we call scaffolding. If they have somebody who supports them, it could be a group of friends, could be a parent, it could be a partner down the road, it could be the system, or a complete lack of resources, lack of support in very shaming environment, shaming teachers. You know, that really depends and affects how people present in front of you. And, and unfortunately, this this is why I have some people with DHT becoming business owners, doctors, lawyers, um, therapists, and then you have some people who drop out in grade eight and really struggle and cannot function much. Um, so that's this is the big thing. So the other thing to remember is that DSM-5-TR is a guide. It's not like this is it. Um, DSM-5 is a fifth edition, texturized. It changes every couple of years. When I was in training, when I was a resident, they actually had exclusion that you could not diagnose ADHD and autism in the same person. That was removed. We know that actually ADHD and autism often presents together and runs in families. But prior to 2013, as if you listen to DSM, it didn't occur. So we have to look at it as a guide. We have to you know, understand what it is. And we also have to keep our mind open and look what is the developing literature in between because it does take several years to update. And you know the clinical literature, the clinical guidelines might not necessarily be exactly what the DSM uh, might contain at that point. For example, you know DSM does not capture a lot of the adult domains of impairment while like financial issues, driving issues, employment issues, relationship issues, or parenting issues. Um, and for example, the DSM uh, 5TR does not include emotional dysregulation is a symptom. Emotional dysregulation is when emotions change very quick and they might be described as quick to anger or misunderstood to have bipolar disorder or other conditions when the emotional changes are because of ADHD. So again, when we look into ADHD, it is a lifelong condition. Uh, when we look at the data, we know that at least 15% of adults continue to meet the full diagnostic criteria by age 25, but more than 50% continue to meet some of the criteria of partial remission throughout adulthood. And I've definitely met patients who are 70 and older who clearly had a DHD all their life, and they have significant family history, their kids, their grandkids. So this is a, a real lifelong condition. Um, again, and so sometimes when we deal with impairment, people used to say, you must have neuropsychological testing. It is not mandatory. It is not required for diagnosis or figuring out impairment. So a better model to understand ADHD is a lifetime model. You know, it's a chronic developmental condition that has presentation across different domains, across different lifetimes. As people get older, the inattentive symptoms become a big issue and a bigger impairment. Inattentive symptoms are responsible for more than 60% of impairment in adulthood versus the hyperactivity that becomes you know, less prominent. But there is the impulsivity issue that persists in an adulthood might look like gambling, unsafe driving, financial difficulties. So impulsivity can still present differently. And people with ADHD and impulsivity issues could potentially gravitate to high-risk jobs like car racing, you know, um, first responders, you know, jobs where there's constant risk, right? So so it, it does last a lifetime. In terms of, you know, this is just a couple of examples that might look through different stages. I did miss 
at the older age crowd, you know, so that because the, again, that geriatric population is something we're still not acknowledging or addressing because it, it, it's hard to under to understand what that might look like. But these, you know, certain issues that we have to be aware, including driving issues and financial issues, and why so many people struggle in a transition age 18 to 25, when all of a sudden they lose many supports, for example, many lots of structure, and they're expected to pay so much cognitive demand of adulthood and more responsibilities, right? So health management is another one that's affected in adults, like missing appointments, medication adherence, you know, skills, all that stuff, huge, huge impact of ADHD on that. And we kind of forget that health management requires executive skills. So this is just a summary. Um, this is the life transition model. Um, again, environmental demands increase across the lifetime, you know, educational, occupational, financial. Anytime there's a transition, people might struggle because it unmasks their difficulties, right? And transition could include cognitive or functional demand change, change in structure, and change in supports. So, for example, becoming a parent is a huge role change, huge cognitive demand, loss of structure, and huge distractions because kids are distracted. Actions. Going to university, uh, start a new job, going from an employee to a manager role, and people often struggle and amass difficulties. So it's emotional dysregulation. Again, the, this is a very unrecognized, misunderstood symptom of ADHD. The lability is a core feature of ADHD, and it's quite severe. It impacts seven out of 10 uh, life domains in adulthood, according to Barclay et al. Barclay is one of the biggest neuropsychologists who've been working with ADHD for over 25 years. So, you know, when you look at his studies, you really learn um, about the emotional dysregulation, and it's throughout the lifespan, from childhood into the adulthood, causes so many problems in so many areas. Um, so that's a core issue with ADHD. Okay, so moving on to how do we diagnose ADHD? Okay, unfortunately, I don't have a magic solution. It is a complicated process, totally manageable, absolutely totally manageable. ADHD is a clinical diagnosis, okay? There's no test, there's no biological test, there's no blood test, there's no uh, imaging test. Um, neuropsychological, psychoeducational testing is often mistakenly thought to be the gold standard. It is not. It is not specific, meaning that it doesn't have, there's no specific issues that a person with ADHD has that will show up on the test. And again, that's what people mistakenly say, well, if you, if you, if it doesn't show up on this, then you don't have it. That's not true. Um, again, CADRA, which is a Canadian ADHD guidelines, specifically talk about that, you know, we shouldn't use like, like more psychological testing to determine severity or, you know, academic function. It, it's not diagnostic. And again, in the expert consensus, uh, expert consen consensus as well, you know, again, it, it's not specific, okay? So we have to be very careful because I've seen some universities or colleges mandating and requiring this testing that costs $3,000 to prove to them that a person has ADHD. And that's a very discriminatory practice uh, because you you can't use this. We don't ask for any other mental health condition or DCM-5 condition for this. So we can't force people to prove that, but they try to get away with it. So it's something that we have to be very aware um, that this is still a clinical diagnosis. So according to GADRA guidelines, um, they propose four steps to kind of uh, making a diagnosis. So step one is information gathering, you know, and that could take several sessions. It doesn't have to be once. And information gathering, again, depending on what life stage you're in, could look differently, right? Um, you could get history, you know, how long did it take, developmental history, what this adult was like as a child. You could try and ask for report cards. That's not realistic uh, for many people, especially if you came from a different country, if you're a refugee, if you had a chaotic upbringing and you moved 20 times or whatnot. And again, most people with DHD are not going to be organized enough to keep 10 years of their report cards or if it's from 20 years ago. So if you're looking at adults, you know, collateral could be their work function, the employment history, you know, are they able to sustain a job? Have they been let go? Um, also, what's the collateral like from people around them? If they have a partner, if they have a case worker, their own behavior with you is also collateral. Are they missing appointments? How are they presenting with us in our interactions, right? So, you know, report cards are not the only source of information gathering. 
employment feedback, employment history is a good one. And I often ask people, not what grades they got, it's how did you get the grades? If I saw you in class, in elementary school, in high school, what would I observe? It's the how, not the grades. Because, you know, some people might have overcompensated. They relied on somebody else. Somebody else pushed them. They procrastinated things last minute. So they could have gotten like A's and done well until they couldn't pull it off with the maladaptive strategies. And so it's it's how. And they could have still been described. And, you know, they might recall to you that teachers would have said, oh, you were scattered, you were chatterbox, or they were punished in school for being disruptive. Um, but, you know, they kind of would have not have made it on record. So I always ask, how would I have observed what, what I see? And then unfortunately, a lot of these people will have a lot of shaming experiences in school, or if they have better social skills, you know, they might have been um, scaffolded by teachers, even without any official accommodations, official testing. I hear this all the time. The teachers would give somebody extra time or do oral presentations instead of, you know, written. And, and they would kind of get through until they hit university or work where, you know, those accommodations are not made. So information gathering could be very important. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, people come from very abusive families, we may not be able to get history from the parent or the family. So we have to accept the boundary and we do our best. And that's limitations, but that is a boundary we have to accept. And sometimes, you know, when I try to talk to the families, they have very limited insight or out of shame, they minimize um, the impairment in childhood. Um, and, and, and that's an issue because they often feel shame that how did I not see this in the child? How could I not this recognize? And so they might minimize um, the level of impairment that somebody had. And so, you know, again, we, we have to non-judgmentally accept that it's a very difficult thing for a parent to go through, but I'm not surprised sometimes when there is very, you know, kind of contradicting stories um, between the parent and a child especially, you know, a child's an adult. So, and, and there's many people who still don't believe in ADHD or think this is all invented. So they will purposely sabotage the collateral piece because they don't believe in ADHD. So we have to be aware of those kind of things. Um, number two is medical review. You know, medical review is important to make sure there's no other medical conditions that could look like ADHD, like head injuries, infections, or other things that, you know, could be explained uh, by a, a medical condition. Uh, CADRA has a very nice package that is free and available, and it has a whole bunch of scales, a whole bunch of forms that anybody could download and use as part of kind of the assessment um, uh, uh, assessment uh, process. And then stage four is kind of feedback from the clinician to the uh, client and treatment recommendations, right, after we kind of agreed that this is the diagnosis. Okay. Um, now, these are, again, some of the questionnaires that are available. These are free, except this one, the Connors one, it's not free. And, and again, these ones you're able to do without any specific training. Some of them require specific training. But again, most of these are available on Kadra website, except the ones that are not free. Um, the other thing about diagnosing ADHD is that Comorbidities are the rule, not the exception. Comorbidities are 85%, meaning that most people have ADHD and potentially mood disorders, anxiety, eating disorders are very common, OCD is very common, tics, autism, skin picking, um, you know, bipolar disorder is reported to occur in 20 to 50% as well. So um, substance use, all sorts of substance use, alcohol, cannabis use, all sorts of stuff, right? So unfortunately, sometimes I get this kind of referrals asking, is it this or this? Most of the time, it's both. And we have to figure out which one's causing the most impairment right now, which one do we need to treat first, right? And again, Kadra guideline talks about that um, in stabilizing particularly bipolar a disorder before we can, you know, address ADHD. So kind of they do give some steps as well. And often I get this question, well, they're smoking pot. How can they have ADHD? The reality is, Pod cannabis is the most abused substance by people with ADHD, so it's very common. And especially now that it's legal, it, it's, it's a very common substance use. The way I differentiate it is doing a very detailed developmental history. And again, most of the time, we're able to figure out that the symptoms preceded the cannabis use, right? And most of the time, people turn to cannabis to manage their emotions, boredom, difficulty sleeping, which is another symptom of ADHD. So when they use the scales, able to help with getting some of the symptoms, 
prior to cannabis, okay? So, you know, the winter youth that could be very helpful in getting those early childhood symptoms. And it's a free scale. So again, it's right here. Um, so and then in a kind of a summary to diagnose ADHD, we have to look at the diagnostic criteria of DSM-5-TR. Remember that the symptoms should have been there before 12, realizing that, you know, sometimes the recall is limited, so we might have to ask several times, we might need to try to get collateral. And we have to look at the symptoms of ADHD. They're long, lifelong. This isn't something that just happened yesterday over the past week or two weeks. You know, if it's a sudden change, we have to look at other issues that could be contributing, right? Because ADHD symptoms in one shape or form, people are like, I've always been this way, you know, I've always interrupted. Oh yeah, this has been before, just didn't get me in trouble before, right? Because ADHD is long-term, lifelong neurodevelopmental condition that just varies in severity and coping strategies and versus something that's episodic, like, you know, bipolar disorder or um, mood disorders. So cadre package provides you with all those questions. If you have the luxury of neuropsychological or psychoeducational testing, that's nice because of the comorbidity, you know, many people with ADHD also will have learning disorders, dyslexia, and other conditions that might be picked up on uh, neuropsychological testing that we don't see clinically. So that would be nice. However, it's about $3,000 and most people don't have access to that. So we can't expect that to make the diagnosis. As I mentioned, it's not required. It is not specific, but it's nice. It's a nice luxury to have. Comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. When we're looking at the diagnosis, we also have to make sure we're not punishing patients for coming up for coping strategies or compensatory strategies. So, you know, that is kind of like that big double whammy that people struggle with. And in a way, it's kind of like this, you know, somebody has a disability. If they manage to accommodate it, does that mean they don't have the disability? No. So we can't do the same thing with people with ADHD, you know, just because they have a job, just because they have managed to, you know, finish schooling and whatnot and obtain high grades does not mean they have ADHD. We really have to ask what are compensatory strategies that people might have come up, especially with the internet today, with some family structures that are more supportive with the awareness. People may have come up with compensatory strategies or masking some of the symptoms that we don't even know about and yet we'll say, oh, well, you know, they don't have issues. And I always ask, you know, how do you pay your bills? How do you manage to make it to the appointments? Not, do you make it to the appointments? And, and most of the time, you know, I'll hear, oh, I put 10 alarms to make it to your appointment, or I've been up since 5 a.m. with multiple alarms to make sure I don't miss your 12 o'clock appointment, right? So that's, that's a lot of effort to make it to a doctor's appointment. But that's the compensatory strategies we have to look that people have come up or learned or been taught through all the internet resources at this point, right? We do have to consider neurotrion diagnosis, repeated assessments, and look outside of just what the patient is telling you. Like I said, you know, missed appointments, engagement with healthcare, managing the information that we provide, employment history, all of those are very big collateral sources of information readily available to us that we often forget because that is all executive function. Anything that's executive function will give you information about what's happening with the patient. Right? So special considerations. This is a big one. It's a huge box of stuff, but I'm just going to get the attention on this. Again, we have to consider ADHD as a chronic neurodental condition. It does not stop. It doesn't magically disappear at age 18. I wish it doesn't. You know, I wish uh, people were not affected for it across a lifespan. But it's a very terrifying experience for parents of kids with ADHD and all the changes that have to go through. That transition age is absolutely so difficult for the kids, for the parents, lack of resources, so much transition. So, so, so difficult, okay? This is where people end up depressed, where people really come to the emergency department suicidal, they're not coping with the transition, there's no resources. And there's no OHIP covered resources, realistically. So it, it, it's a very con difficult condition that we have to support through transitions. Huge intergenerational component because parents will have ADHD and they have to parent kids with ADHD. And it's a double whammy. 
very difficult for parenting, lots of shame, lots of parent-child conflict, lots and lots of things can go bad or good. Again, we have to provide supports and we have very limited supports for parents with ADHD. We have to consider geriatric population because adults will become geriatric population. And I have seen multiple times where, you know, the parents of my adult patients are like, this is how I was. You know, I didn't know there was a difference. And there's a lot of grief in all the things that they missed and all the things that could have been. And then you have medical conditions that might prevent them from trying treatment. And then people are like, well, is this dementia or this ADHD? So there's a lot of considerations to think about. We really have to acknowledge that we do really poor job with ADHD and BIPOC patients, a huge under detection in US and in Canada. We also don't consider this in our indigenous patients. We also have to understand that immigrants and refugees don't necessarily have access to this because again, if somebody's required a $3,000 assessment, that's a ton of money, um, as well as understanding what ADHD is, and I'm speaking here as an immigrant myself who arrived as a child. So again, my parents would have never been able to navigate the educational system if I had trouble. And I see this all the time where we have, you know, newcomers to Canada lost in the system because they don't know how to advocate. They don't know if the kid is struggling. It's seen as kids lazy rather than it could be actually DHD learning disability. We also have to consider low resource geographical areas you know, Northern Ontario, even anywhere outside of GTA, realistically, um, access to OHIP covered care or assessments or, or whatnot. It's very different, even for school uh, situations and picking it up in kids. So this is why we have all these adults who have never been diagnosed, even though they've had significant issues all throughout life, right? Women have always been missed in mainstream medicine and they've been missed with ADHD because they often present with inattentive symptoms, not the hyperactive. So they've been often misdiagnosed with anxiety or depression. They'll often present to their family doctor with, I'm anxious when they're actually overwhelmed. Postpartum, they're missed because they get overwhelmed and they become the angry, irritable parent because of the cognitive overload, sleep disruption and everything else. And we have to understand the reproductive hormones affect women across a lifetime. So premenstrual symptoms are often made worse by um, with ADHD because of the estrogen drop the week before the bleeding. With pregnancy, there is an impact, postpartum, breastfeeding, medication safety. So a lot of that is really differently affects women. Um, and, and, and again, how women are often judged and, you know, they might be overpleasing, they might struggle with boundaries because they want to accommodate these difficulties, right? Um, we often miss the high functioning people who are often gifted, intelligent, they're performing well academically, yet they can't keep a job, yet they're struggling, they can't keep up with the family um, obligations or driving. So we have often kind of judged that people with DHD are always low functioning, which is not true. And again, that's very stigmatizing. Uh, we have to promote accommodations um, because again, many places will not understand accommodations for ADHD at work, at school. Like I said, you know, several universities make it very difficult and I have to fight with them all the time. It is a human rights issue. ADHD is a condition recognized by the Human Rights uh, Code in Ontario. I also would encourage everybody to look at ADHD in a strength-based approach. This is not a deficit. This is a difference, in my opinion, as a psychiatrist, psychiatrist to diagnosis and treats ADHD, and as a mother to children with ADHD. My children are not defective. My children are fine. The system is defective that does not support them that I have to fight as a physician constantly to accommodate their basic human rights. And that is the fight that people with ADHD have to live every single day in every way, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's their doctor, whether it's getting their prescription at the pharmacy. So we do have to acknowledge the strengths while accommodating the deficits. And that is, I hope, the message that we can walk away with, that the strengths, lots of strengths in people with ADHD, but only focus on the deficit and the only focus is deficit bad enough to meet the diagnostic criteria without realizing that this is such a big condition that affects people differently. And realistically, our understanding in ADHD and adults is really lagging behind. And as a system, we have to do better. We have to do better in recognizing and supporting our patients in so many ways, but particularly strength-based approach because people with ADHD are not defective, they're different.